Hi, friends, and welcome to the School Librarian Learning Network podcast. I'm Steve Tatro, also known as Dr. T Loves Books, and I love talking about all things related to school libraries. I may be an old dog, but I'm always trying to learn new tricks. In each episode of the SLLN podcast, I'll chat with a school librarian about a lesson they love. Hopefully, this can be a place for school librarians to get ideas and find new ways to engage with their students and staff. As a good friend likes to say, we're better together. So I hope this podcast will help school librarians connect with and learn from each other. The opinions and ideas shared in this podcast by myself and my guests are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. And because school librarians always strive to be good digital citizens, I cite sources when using material that is not my own. Without further ado, let's get to this week's episode. Welcome back, everybody. I am so excited. I am getting to talk to a sort of a surprise guest almost. Um, so I am very excited about this. Lori, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, why don't you take a second and tell everybody who you are, where you're at? So I'm Lori Stansberry. I'm here in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to have you. Um, there was a little bit of schedule shuffling, and I was looking for someone to help me fill a, a little hole in the recording schedule, and Lori was so kind to offer to take some of her time while she's on vacation to share a lesson. And it's a really, as she was telling me about this lesson, I am very excited and interested to hear about how this uh, plays out. So... Um, before we dive into it, let's just take a second and maybe set the stage. How did you end up getting into school librarianship? Sure. Um, so I've been an educator for 18 years. Nice. And when I started, I was an English teacher in high school. And it was very quickly, while I don't particularly care for grading, this is not <laughs> quite what I signed up for. And uh, it, it was 14 years before <laughs> I, I finished library school and made that transition. And so now I'm in an elementary library and I absolutely love it. Wow. I've been there four years. So that's a day and night transition from high school down to the little ones. Boy, more power yeah. to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got a lot of energy down at the lower levels. <laughs> um, so. Where did this lesson come from? Before we get into the lesson itself, like what was sort of the genesis of it? So uh, my first year as a librarian um, was the COVID year. Oh my mm, goodness. Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm new to elementary. I'm new to all these kids. So I leaned hard on my strengths. And one, I was very comfortable with Canvas. Uh, that was the learning M LMS that our, our school district okay. um, used because I used it in college and I used it a little bit when I taught high school. So I knew I could use that as a comfort zone. Um and the second thing was I grew up um, in the Southwest and I moved around a little bit, not too much, uh, but I had this deep appreciation for all things culture and community because I lived around a military base. Oh, So I thought, well, what can I do to make my library better? Uh, well, we had 19, we have 20 different spoken languages at our school. Wow. Yeah. So I thought, <laughs> oh my goodness, what if I got bilingual books for my students that were in their native languages that they could share with others? They could practice their English. They could practice their native language. And our local um, education foundation that supports our school district loved my idea and they gave me $5,000. Wow. To start up um, a book club that was virtual with Canvas. And with our LMS, and I also taught languages and my library lessons. So some of them were a little bit bilingual. And it was a phenomenal way to introduce myself and, and get yeah. the kids excited. And um, this is one of the lessons that came out of that. Oh, wow. That yeah. is so great. Wow. I mean, I'm not surprised that they wanted to give you money for this program because this is a brilliant idea. But like, that's a nice little chunk of money they gave you for this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... All right. Um, we know where the lesson came from. Now tell us a little bit about the lesson. Like how is how does this unfold? Maybe I'm a student and then I come into the library. What am I going to see? How's this going to go? Well, if I started it traditionally as a unit, um, I would introduce the concept of language learning and being comfortable with not understanding everything. Um, when I originally taught it, it, was the fourth lesson that I gave to my students. They would okay. have already heard a made-up bug language from the book Do Is Talk by Carson oh, Ellis. Such a good book. 
They would have heard a bilingual story by Yugi Morales. We had taught dreamers, and they got to hear it in English and Spanish. Nice. And we talked about tone and how the meaning, and then my Spanish students could share that, yeah, there was a slight difference in meaning, but it is a picture book. So the complexity and depth of language may be not as strong as, say, reading two novels. Um, and then we got into the Arabic quilt, which is by Aya Khalil. And I'm, I'm pretty confident I'm saying that right. Um, she is from the Ohio area. Okay. And she this was her debut picture book. And in it, she, she explores the idea that this Egyptian American has come to a new school and she's unsure and she's sharing her loves. And her love is her Egyptian culture, her grandmother, her quilt, her grandmother made her. And the little girl um, writes poetry. And as she gets into her classroom, she encounters a student who's not open to new culture and doesn't understand that there's cultural differences. Hmm. And uh, they end up doing this amazing school project where every student in the class gets an Arabic name from their mother, from the student's mother. Oh. The and they make their own Arabic quilt of names uh, in Arabic with a um, beautiful designs and put it on the bulletin board and uh, i thought oh my gosh we have to do this that is a beautiful story wow mm -hmm. is that it's not a, a a title that i've heard before is that mm -hmm. a, like a newer title it's um I, i'd have to look up sorry i didn't mean long. to put you on the spot like that that's okay yeah. <laughs> um it's i'd say in the last well obviously um i taught this first four years ago so it's okay. definitely within that under 10 years okay. and the author has since wrote a follow-up um, and it explores the idea of banned books oh. in elementary and middle school. And the main character in her story, Kenzie, um, which I didn't mention her name earlier, um, Kenzie, um, encounters the community has just banned her favorite book. And its characters just look like her. And there's, oh. why are they banning the book? Yeah. It's multicultural, a different culture. So um, it's a it's a nice follow up to that. Um, something that's very relevant that the author saw in the news and, and felt compelled to write about. Yeah, boy. Well, now I've got two new books to add to my list of books to bring to my library. I love that. Um, wow. Okay. So you read the story with the students and once they've heard the story, I'm assuming that there's some, maybe some conversation as they're going about how this might connect with them in some way. Right. Before I read the story, I introduced the concept of being bilingual. Oh, okay. And I asked the kids, what does bilingual mean? And usually someone in the room um, knows. I, the first year I taught it second to, or third through fifth. And then I've been teaching it to third grade ever since. Okay. Um, and usually they know what bilingual means, um, especially there will usually be someone in there. Um, and if you don't know, quite a few don't know. Um, and we talk about how exciting that is. Now, I found an amazing audio recording of this book on YouTube. And librarians, I know you want to read this book with your kids, and you can. But there are two parts of the YouTube video I'm going to share with you that you want to share with your students. And the first part is the narrator um, begins her video in Arabic. Oh. And then she immediately translates into English. So the kids get to hear Arabic hear that English translation. And I always replay it. I said, let's hear that again. Isn't that a beautiful language? Yeah. And so they get to hear that beautiful greeting in Arabic. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. that's, that's such a great resource to add to this lesson too. Like on mm -hmm. top of just a great lesson, here's a great little additional piece that you can throw in there. Yes. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, and then later on in the story, there is a moment where the classroom teacher in the picture book uh, connects four words that were introduced to English from Arabic. And the narrator of the audio recording does a quick little aside and not only says, you know, that's right, but she pronounces each of those words in Arabic. Hmm. And what I love is I ask my kids who speak other languages, are you hearing 
does it sound like a word in your language? Mm. And my Spanish students are like, yes, yes. And my Ukrainian, yes, yes. I think even one of my French students got excited. And they'll, they'll tell us that native word that connects to the Arabic word that connects to the English word. And, and then my students get to see how all the languages connect. Oh, that's so great. I yeah. love that idea of introducing the kids this idea of like the cognates of various languages, because that's for me, I am not great at... Um, languages other than English. But the one hook that usually got me through when I had like a Spanish class was at least there's some words that are sort of similar to English or like I know the Latin root that goes to the Spanish root, like getting the kids to realize we may have separate languages, but there are connections between them. That's such a great thread to build. Oh, wow. Nice. Mm -hmm. So cool. Hmm. Okay. So Awesome. Two great resources built in as you're going, as you're sharing the story with the students. Okay. And they're thinking about bilingualism, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you bring up bilingualism and I, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent and I apologize in advance, but it's so funny because today, for some reason, it was in my head that um, we refer to bilingual and we kind of think of, if you speak more than English, you're bilingual. And we know that the root of bilingual is two languages. And so the default is, I think, and, and this is maybe just my own preconception, but in America, we tend to think of it as you speak English and you maybe speak one other language. And like we talk about, we used to talk about our students as English as a second language students, mm -hmm. but now we'd refer to them as ELL, English language learners, because so many of them have so many more languages than just their home language and English. And I think we've got this sort of bias that we were sort of amazed and surprised when people can speak more than home language and maybe one other language. And yet some of these kids are so multilingual. It's just, it boggles the mind. So to introduce the kids to these concepts and get them thinking about the fact that, yes, there may be people who speak an other language, but there's also people who are going to speak so many more than just one other language. And we can take part in that. We can become part of those different languages and take part in those conversations. That's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. I introduced the word polygot right behind bilingual. Ooh, nice. That's yep. such a great word. <laughs> That's so cool. So they're getting the idea of bilingual and polyglot and multilingual. They're hearing some, I love that they're hearing some Arabic. I think that's something that probably isn't particularly familiar for a lot of kids. That's so wonderful. And then, so they're reading the, this story, you're hearing about the story of how they're going to, the students in the school get these Arabic names and then they, they, I imagine that they maybe stitch them into the quilt. Is that, did I get that right? It's more of a bulletin board with okay. um, different shapes of colorful pictures of construction paper and designs the kids all do gotcha. and then you assemble it into a bulletin board quilt uh, but uh yeah it's beautiful because we take the kenzie's grandmother's quilt that was personally made for her and then now they've shared their culture both their language and the quilt with her classmates which is just beautiful it is it really is so I, i'm going to apologize because i think in my head i have combined a couple of things that are separate. So in the story, the kids learn about Kenzie's grandmother's quilt. Mm -hmm. And then you discuss with the students making a poster board quilt that's going to involve their names. So in the story, there's not a section about the students creating quilts with their other language names. No, they do. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, <laughs> I thought I was blending things together uh, nope. incorrectly there. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I love that, that they're, I mean, anytime you can bring a grandma in, that's just a win. You know, every kid's, you know, going to think about their grandparents. So that's, that's great. And the story itself just sounds so wonderfully um, uniting and just helping kids to see beyond what may seem like a really major difference to understand that, well, maybe that difference is not as big as you think it is. And maybe there's ways we can think about how to get past it with each other. Hmm. Yeah. The author um, also explores the idea of a classmate who, as I said before, is not um, understanding and is confused and, and kind of makes fun of our hmm. main character 
um, Kenzie and those some great opportunities for conversation about um, compassion and kindness and friendship. So um, there's some some opportunities there as well. That's so great. Huh. So you at, at this point, having finished the story with the students and had these wonderful conversations, what is the next step for the students to engage in? Um, as class time allows, um, I might roll into the, the second part, but usually I spread this between two libraries. We have 45 minutes and my third graders tend to take an extraordinarily <laughs> amount, a long amount of time to check out, which is <laughs> a good problem. Yeah. Yeah. So the next time we meet, um, they would come in and I would introduce them to what the concept is of translation versus transliteration. And I don't mm. hit on that word too hard with my kiddos. I just use the word translate. But translate is when you take a word and find out the meaning of it and then find the connecting word. Whereas transliterate would be to take your word and just pronounce it in the second language the same way you would in your original language. Interesting. Okay. I, I'm, I'm wrapping, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. Okay. So in other words, it, I just want to see if I've got this right. If I was reading a passage that was in Spanish, let's say, mm -hmm. if I'm reading it, if I'm reading the words in Spanish, then I'm transliterating. Um, no. So you're just, so my name is the best way to do this. Um, okay. My name um, in Arabic sounds almost, Lori sounds almost exactly the same. Okay. That's transliteration. Oh, okay. Yeah, translation is when you find out Lori actually means laurel. Oh. From in the crown of laurel, the, the laurel leaves that yeah. Julius Caesar and all the Romans wore. Yeah. So I take the word laurel, which is a noun, and translate that into Arabic. And then I get my Arabic name. Ah, okay. So it I has see. a different sound. It's, it expresses the meaning of my name. I see. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Huh. I honestly, I don't know how long I've been in education now. I never understood. I never would have realized there was a difference between those uh, uh, ways of looking at the language. That's so great. Thank you, you for teaching me that? something. I had to do research about this. <laughs> and before we met today, I had to re-research to make sure I would explain it correctly. Oh, that's great. Okay. Oh, I love it. Okay. So we talk about the difference between mm -hmm. translating and transliterating. Mm -hmm. And then where do the students go with that? So I use a website called Behind the Name, and mm -hmm. it's a pretty good, robust resource. Now, there's going to be a lot of language that your students, if they're third graders, will not understand. Mm -hmm. But essentially, there's a clear heading that says... Um, you type in your name, and if your name is a diminutive or it originates from another name, there'll be a link. And so Lori, I click on Laura, and then it gives me um, Laura or Lawrence, and I click Laura because I tell them I'm a girl, and my <laughs> parents didn't name me after Lawrence, <laughs> even though Lori is a nickname of Lawrence. And, <laughs> and I get to Laura, and then I get to the meaning, which fortunately behind the name puts in quote marks. So it'll say meaning <laughs> in history, and you can direct the kids to the quote mark part, and they can ignore all the rest of the language. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully it's <laughs> one word, <laughs> but sometimes it's more than one. And so we have to finesse and play around a little bit to figure out what we're going to translate. Yeah. Um, so we take that meaning and... Laurel meant nothing to my kids. It means nothing to me. So I went to dictionary.com and looked up all the definitions and that still didn't mean anything. So I took the kids to Kittle. And honestly, if I did this again, I would look up a kid-friendly dictionary. To do ah, this. So I need to, I need to do that. Gotcha. Um, Although kind of a nice lesson in like, here's how we can do research. Like if we don't find what we need, let's try a different source. But absolutely, mm -hmm. like if for time's sake and for this lesson, it absolutely would make sense to, okay, we've got our resource lined up. Right. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So you're going Not to get all. <laughs> I take them to dictionary.com. We look up the definitions. We're still scratching our heads. We need a picture. So I kittle because the images are curated for children. 
And now we've got some images that make sense. Ah. So there's a picture of the three of the different definitions that connect to my name. And then there's a picture of the laurel wreath and crowns. And I pointed it and I say, this is what everyone says my name means. And they think that's really cool that I'm named after this crown. Yeah. Um, so from there, we finally go to Google Translate, pop in the word laurel and select Arabic. And we get to hear it pronounced, which is the best. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's such a great feature. And then we move from Arabic, we can quickly click into other languages. Right. So know your room. If you have a Russian speaker, you're translating into Russian. Mm -hmm. If you have, and in this story, I didn't mention this earlier, but they, a classroom across the hall does the same project in Japanese. Oh, okay. So I translate to Japanese and, you know, we translate to Spanish. It's, it's fun. They get to hear it. The kids don't even care about putting their names on a quilt or on a piece of paper or a Google slide at this point. All they want to do is keep clicking and listening to their names in different languages. Yeah. Just a cacophony of noise, but <laughs> it is joyful and excitement. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's all I would want to do. I'd just be playing around and seeing what my name sounds like. Oh, that's oh, really sure. neat. <laughs> so having heard their names, in theory, now mm -hmm. that they've got a translation... They're going to try and take that and make that part of a uh, a quilt that they're going to work with. I have a simple Google slide with different little boxes, and it says, "This is my name. This is what my name means. This is the language, and here's and that's the letters, the script, not a link to the pronunciation or anything." And then from there, the directions are decorate with pictures and and uh, shapes and whatever you want. And I never give them enough time to do all of that. I know they would have so much fun, but uh, just in terms of thinking of my third graders, um, I don't think they have a stamina all the time for that. So yeah, yeah. the year they do, I will do that. But yeah. so far, not so much. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I could almost see that even just being an additional day of like, okay, we've learned what our words are and we've heard them in different ways. Take it home. Think about it. What would you do for designs? And then like, we'll come back and we'll do that some, you know, another time. But that is so, I, I can, I am not a lower grades teacher, but I can see in my head the excitement and the activity as the kids are engaging with all of this. It's just, oh boy, that's got to be so wonderful. Oh, it is. Um, the kids, um, they get so excited. They share with me the words that they can say in other languages, even if it's only two. Yeah. They tell me all about my grandmother speaks this language or I can, I, I, my family speaks this language. And then the next visit, they're checking out my bilingual books left and right, nice. trying to learn new languages. It's amazing. That's awesome. Wow. And I mean, I, I've said it before and I'll say it a million times, I'm sure, but when you can get the kids authentically engaged with anything, they are going to dig into it so much more than we can do as like sage on the stage or even guide on the side. Like when they are authentically with it and, and into it and inquiring, oh my gosh, what a powerful learning tool that is. Oh, boy. I am so excited for your students that they get to do this. <laughs> oh, yeah. The very last thing I show them is I will take them back to the website behind the name. And at the top, there is a tab that says related names where they've already pulled the common versions of your name in several languages. Oh. And so you can see, I mean, Laura is Laura in almost every language. And I said, look, Icelandic, <laughs> it's Lara. <laughs> and that made me think of the golden compass every time. I'm like, oh, that was me. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. I bet that a bunch of kids then are going around and saying, call me, <laughs> call me Ishmael. Well, probably not that, but <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, this is, there's so much. What I love about this is there's so much fun for the kids and what the, and, and how they're going through this. Like it's such a, a joyful learning experience, it sounds like. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Especially that anticipation where we read the story, we saw the project, the class across the hall did it in Japanese, too, and we get to do it next week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next week, they are in their seats, ready to go. Oh, I um, bet. Challenges I ran into. Um, some kids have names with non-traditional spellings. 
So mm-hmm. you have to show them to type in a more traditional spelling. Okay. And some kids have some very unusual names that are unique, which is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, you may need to do a quick Google search on the side, or you may need to switch to transliteration for that friend. Okay. Those are great points to bear in mind. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you how you sort of differentiate for this, but I think the differentiation is completely built in. Like this lesson is all about differentiating because we're helping kids, it, whether there's a language issue or not, like we're helping them find ways to sort of overcome barriers right. that might be there. Right. I definitely use um, table partners quite a bit. If a friend finishes early, um, I'll ask them to help their table friends or um, move on to another table and help everybody get caught up to the same step. Um, I'll run around with my phone and have Google Translate if I need to give the directions in another language. Oh, yeah. That's a good Um, point. Yeah. Hmm. That's I I have relied on last year. I was relying on Google Translate a lot. We had some students who were very limited English proficient and I did not speak a lick of Portuguese and I was trying to communicate with this student and we just would pass my phone back and forth with Google Translate going so that we could have conversations. That's such a great tool. Hmm. That's a nice one to have literally in your back pocket. You can have it ready to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's always there. Yeah. So clearly the students love this lesson. They do. Um, this, I, have, have you had students come back to like later, at some point later, talk about this lesson and kind of like mention it as something that they remember or something that um, is sort of sticking out in their minds as something fun that they did? So I've taught it several years. So at uh, this point of the year, I put the Arabic quilt out on display and my fourth graders and fifth graders will come in. I remember that book. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That clearly lands. Like when they can mm-hmm. come back years later and talk about, oh yeah, I remember that. Have there been any reactions from the teachers? From the, um, how, are, are there any ways that like the teachers have mentioned that it might be getting brought into their classes or is there any like collaboration you do with the teachers as this goes along? Uh, well, I was doing a huge unit my very first year and I can tell you that first year because it was such a huge emphasis. Um, we had a fourth grade classroom that did a homeroom study club to learn Spanish for their friends. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So if you make language and culture a focus for a a unit, you will see the kids want to teach each other. They want to learn and they want to share. And what a great way to put some of the agency in the hands of the kids who might be limited English proficient Mm -hmm. to give them that authority and that ownership of some learning going on. Oh, for sure. And the other thing that um, is huge is my um, Arabic culture students or Arabic speakers. Um, Ms. Stansbury, do you have any more books that are like this? Um, so the answer is yes. I've got plenty in English. And I've got plenty in Arabic. Um, the majority of my students who are Arabic speaking are not Arabic reading. And it's 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 a question of time and access and mm-hmm. um, and that's not unique to Arabic. There are other languages where the students may speak it quite fluently, but just haven't had access or the opportunity to learn how to read it in its written form. Yeah. No, I mean, that's completely understandable. Um, mm-hmm. But that's really great that they are interested in finding out more about their own language and culture in this way. That's such oh, a yeah. nice, a, a great way for them to sort of engage further with their own culture. And I mean, what a great reflection for the, let's say the uh, English, uh, 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 native English speakers to be able to say, look, we can all learn more about our language and our culture and where this, you know, even though we may think we know a lot, there's always more to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've had um, requests to add languages um, every year since. Um, Greek was the one that surprised me. They okay. Went, a friend had a Greek ancestry and you heard his last name and yes, he was Greek. <laughs> so I had to add Greek. Um, and then um, Korean. Interesting. I, I, I don't have any English language learners who speak Korean, but I have families that do speak Korean, even though their children came to us speaking English. Yeah. And so that was one we had to add as well, um, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Mm, man, that's great that you're getting that feedback too. Is that coming from parents? Uh, parents and students. Okay. So uh, our, some of our book uh, book fair volunteers 
Oh, you know, gotcha. get to see the collection. They're like, when are you going to add Korean? That's awesome. Wow. That's a great connection to the community too. Mm -hmm. mm, boy. Oh yeah. Um, our local friends of the library found out that I have an extensive collection because I made a post mm -hmm. and I haven't seen it as yet, but they're doing a feature in their local newsletter about our collection and how I've found French books at their local friends of the library bookstore. That's awesome. And, yeah. I mean, if you need the resources, you can find them. You just have to do your homework and, and get in there. Well, that's one area that we tend to excel at, our school librarians. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll track them down. Um, so it seems like, I, I mean, there's so many amazing pieces to this. Um, are there any particular pieces of advice? I mean, you've given so many great ones, but are there any particular pieces of advice you might have for somebody who's going to try this out for the first time? Well, I would say that the antagonist in the Arabic quilt um, can be a little snotty and snooty <laughs> and really be prepared for how you want to deliver it and discuss it. Okay. Um, the narrator on the YouTube video does a great job, and I often find myself pulled away helping a kid make final checkout selections, or I might have a teacher come in. So I do hit play sometimes. Other times, I will read the story myself. Okay. That's great. That's good to know. Oh, man. Oh, I am. I'm. I love this lesson, and and you're doing it with a really young group, and it's really amazing that they are connecting with it so well. And I'm I'm already starting to imagine ways you could even like age this up or use this in different kinds of ways, or even exactly the same way with older populations too. I will say, uh, back in my high school teaching days, <laughs> uh, many many years ago with juniors, I had a component of a research project we put together that used behind the name where the kids were asked to look at the history of their name. And they loved it just as much as the third graders do. Oh, I bet. I they bet. They were very fascinated to find out not only what their name meant, but they could understand and appreciate the history of, oh, this famous person had this name or it comes from this language or this culture or country. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, aren't we all that self-centered? I want to know everything about me. <laughs> right. But that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. Oh, love it. Thank you so much for sharing this lesson. We're now going to go in a 90 degree turn and we're going to go to our book break. Book break. Squiggy. All right. Anything you want to share can be for school, for personal, for kids, for adults, whatever you like. What's a great book that we should know about? Well, all of our kids enjoy making videos and YouTube and The Partition Project by Sadia Faruqi. Okay. And my deepest apologies. I practiced that name. I think I've got it correct. Um, it is a fun little story. It's a middle grade novel that the main character, Maya, um, is in a class where she wants to learn about journalism and they're going to make documentaries film documentaries okay. on a project of their choice hmm. and they're competing with their classmates to see which classmate will get the most views. So I our main it. character, Maya, uh, is also having a concern. Her Pakistani grandmother has just moved into her home. Hmm. And while her grandmother is bilingual, um, she's feeling a little put out because her grandmother took her bedroom. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> and she's been asked to spend time with her after school like she's babysitting grandma mm. and so there's some tension there um but it turns out grandmother was a girl 12 years old the same age as maya um during partition mm. so you get to learn about a little bit of the india and pakistan formation post-world war ii and the story of partition um faruqi mentions other books, both for adults and middle grade readers, that explore the idea of partition in a in its and it's in the narrative in such a beautiful, beautiful way. It's just laid out like, hey, here's the night diary. Here's and I I can't remember the name of the other book, but I added it to my to be read on good rates. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, it's just beautifully done. And the history, very appropriate for our elementary readers. And if they want to know more, the um, Night Dyer, which I also have in my school library, um, it gets a little bit heavier, um, more into the middle school reading. Um, but mm -hmm. I think the partition project with that 12-year-old narrator, 
definitely appeals to that middle school age for sure. Yeah. And um, that's an area I've got to admit that I am woefully ignorant about the actual history of partition. And I love the idea that we can, that there are some great books out there that are enjoyable to read on their own, but also you can learn something from them. And mm-hmm. this sounds like one that I need to move higher up on my TBR list because it's it's on my list, but I, it's a little further down. So now I got to I got to bump that up. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to say thanks, Nick Galley, because I got to read it before it came out. So whew. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome wow so that is definitely i mean that sounds like something i need to not only have in my library but i need to get it into my own hands as soon as i possibly can hmm. oh yeah awesome that is great Lori. i cannot thank you enough for coming and sharing a great lesson a great book for taking your time during your vacation to share with us to help me fill in. I mean, it has just been so wonderful. I'm so glad that we got to do this. Uh, So thank you, thank you, thank you a million times. If people want to track you down online to find out what you're up to, I know you're always doing awesome stuff, clearly. Where should they go? Where where should they be looking for you? Um, I'm at Lori Stansberry on Facebook, uh, Twitter, now X, and (laughs) Blue Sky. And then on Instagram, I'm Lori Stansbury Librarian. And then on Facebook, because that's where my parents are, I have a (laughs) school um, page, uh, CBES for Cedar Bluff Elementary School Library. Gotcha. In my head, when you said that's where my parents are, I thought your personal parents were there. And that, and I I didn't make the connection at first that that's why you had the school library one, but that totally Mm -hmm. makes sense. (laughs) That's that's just me having a real uh, brain fog there, but (laughs) (laughs) thank you again. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, And hopefully we'll get to talk to you again sometime soon. I would love to. You are so welcome. You bring so much joy to library lessons and library world. And so thank you for putting this podcast out there and sharing so many amazing um, connections so we can all be stronger and better together. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for checking out this episode of the SLLN podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes, which include not only a link to the lesson, but also links to the SLLN website, home to a curated list of free upcoming virtual events and resources for school librarians. It's easy to become a member of the network. Just visit the site and use what you like. If you have an idea, a question, or a lesson you want to share, you can email schoolliblearning at gmail.com. That's school, L-I-B, learning at gmail.com. Know someone with a great school library lesson? Let us know. Until next time, be safe, be good, and be well.